It's September of 1907. Cunard's new ship, Lusitania, has just made her maiden voyage, declaring her the largest ship in the world. Bruce Ismay, the director of White Star Line, and Lord Peary, the chairman of Harlan Wolf, decide on the construction of three new liners, which would trench the Lusitania class in size and luxury. In early 1908, designer Thomas Andrew presented the design to White Star, labeled Plan D, this design would lay the groundwork for what would become the Olympic class. The names were decided somewhere around this time, with the lead ship, Olympic, starting construction in December of 1908, Titanic starting construction in March of 1909, and Britannic starting construction in November of 1911, the topic of today's video. It was rumored that the original name was actually going to be Gigantic, although this was later debunked by Harlan Wolf, saying how the name Gigantic was only ever used when describing the ship's width. Tom McCluskey, an archive manager at Harlan Wolf, stated how he never saw any reference to the name being used as a third ship in the Olympic class. Who knows though, maybe it was suggested. I highly doubt that though. In Belfast, Ireland, on November 11th, 1911, the keel of what would become Britannic was laid down. The ship would occupy the infamous Aero Gantries, specifically Olympics, which 13 months earlier had been launched and 7 days earlier was occupied by the small steamer Arlanza. Shortly into the construction, it was believed that Britannic would have a very similar configuration to Olympic and Titanic. Although, with Titanic sinking on April 15, 1912, it was clear she would need to be changed. Unlike Olympic, these changes would occur before the ship was even launched, which gave a lot more freedom in terms of what could be seriously altered. Some of these changes included raising the ship's beam to 94 feet allowing for a double hole along the engine and boiler rooms, raising six wire-tight bulkheads all the way to B-deck, and an upgraded turbine engine, which had 2,000 more horsepower. Many of these changes were of a direct response to Titanic sinking. One of the biggest changes, though, would come from the ship's wire-tech compartments. Previously, the ship could stay afloat with up to four wire-tech compartments flooded, but because Titanic had flooded just one more compartment than she could handle, which led to the water overflowing the bulkheads, the central compartment was strengthened, allowing for up to six compartments to be flooded before the pumps were overwhelmed. Additionally, after the ship was launched, she would be fitted with large crane-looking davits, powered by an electric motor capable of launching up to six lifeboats. The ship was originally going to have eight of these davits, but only five were installed before she was rushed out into service. They were also originally going to be put in a place which enabled them to grab lifeboats from any side of the ship, meaning that even if the ship had a heavy list, all of the lifeboats could be launched. This obviously never happened though, as the five which were installed were put next to the ship's funnels, thus creating a wall between the ship's port and starboard sides. After many delays involving the ship's structural changes, 
RMS Britannic was finally launched on February 26, 1914. Throughout the next few months, Britannic would be fitted out, going into dry dock where her propellers were fitted on. Before Britannic could even be finished though, construction would be slowed, as increasing tensions between Great Britain and Germany would eventually cause the declaration of World War I. At first, it was thought to use Britannic as an armed merchant cruiser, but that idea was quickly forgotten. Because of her size and the high risk of her sinking in battle, the Navy would instead requisition smaller ships, leaving Britannic sitting in Belfast as construction slowed more and more. Eventually though, as the war reached the eastern Mediterranean, the need for naval shipping would become critical. In May of 1915, Britannic completed her engine trials, and was given a four-week notice for an emergency entrance into service. Less than a few days later, the large liner Lusitania would be lost, signifying the first ocean liner lost in the war. Britannic was originally going to be requisitioned as a troop transport in the Gallipoli campaign, alongside Mauritania and Aquitania. But with casualties rising, the need for floating hospitals, known as hospital ships, also rose. Because of this, on November 13, 1915, along with the Aquitania, the HMHS Britannic was finally requisitioned as a hospital ship. The ship was rushed, meaning not everything was completed. Most of the unfinished parts of the ship, though, were things not required for a hospital ship. Plus, all the necessary stuff was finished, and that was all that really mattered. The ship was sporting a mostly white paint scheme, with three large red crosses on each side, as well as an equally large green stripe, which ran the length of the ship. As for the interior, most of her luxurious furnishings had been removed, with only the bare minimum remaining. Most of the public spaces on the ship were transformed into rooms for the wounded, with the first class dining room on the first class reception room on D deck transformed into operating rooms and the first-class suites on B-deck transformed into cabins for doctors. In total, 3,309 beds would be installed for the wounded, meaning she was one of the largest hospital ships afloat next to Aquitania. The ship's staff consisted of 101 nurses, 336 non-commissioned officers, 52 commissioned officers, and 675 crew. Finally, the ship would be commanded by Captain Charles Bartlett, who was around 47 at the time. On December 23, 1915, Britannic departed from Liverpool en route to Mudros Limanos, a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. During the voyage, she would join Mauritania, Aquitania, and Olympic. Three days later, she would pass Gibraltar, signifying her entry into the Mediterranean. That same day, at 11.30 a.m., a lifeboat drill was held, showing off the new technology of the gantry davits. On December 28th, she reached her first stop in Naples, Italy, where she would be resupplied for the long stop journey to Southampton, England. Two days later on the 30th, she departed, passing Messina in the early morning hours before finally reaching Mudros the next day on the 31st. Throughout the morning, she would take on thousands of wounded soldiers from other hospital ships until January 3rd, 1916, when she would depart fully packed for a non-stop journey to Southampton. Two days later, in the morning of January 5th, Samuel L. Jones jumped overboard in an apparent suicide, although no one could know for sure. Nevertheless, the following evening, Britannic passed Gibraltar, signifying her entry back into the Atlantic. Less than four days later, on January 9th, she would reach Southampton, where the 4,200 personnel aboard would disembark. Only 11 days later, Britannic would depart for her second voyage, which would take her on the same route to Mudros to support the Gallipoli campaign. At 7am on January 25th, she would arrive in Naples for the typical resupply of coal and water. Britannic was scheduled to depart the next morning, but never would, as Captain Bartlett received orders to stay in Naples. Instead, throughout the next 11 days, Britannic would receive the wounded from other smaller hospital ships coming from Mudros. A total of five would transport around 2,400 wounded soldiers aboard the ship before she finally departed Naples on January 5th bound for Southampton. Four days later, on the 9th, she would reach her destination. For the next four weeks, she would stay in port, acting as a floating hospital rather than a hospital ship. Finally though, on the 20th of March 1916, Britannic would depart yet again from the same route except this time around for Augusta, Sicily. 
Five days later, on the 25th, she would arrive in Naples for her usual resupply before departing the next day. Britannic would reach Augusta on the 28th, with smaller hospital ships transferring the wounded. By 3 p.m. on the 30th, with her beds fully packed, she departed for Southampton, reaching her destination on March 1st, 1916. For a full month, Britannic would sit in port as the Gallipoli evacuation had slowed substantially. There simply was no need for a large hospital ships anymore, which was punctuated as both Mauritania and Aquitania would be released from their hospital ship duties throughout the month. Britannic, though, would remain in port until eventually she was removed from Southampton to Cowes on April 11, 1916. Finally, though, on the 25th of April, Britannic would be released from her hospital ship duties, having only completed three voyages. Because of this, Britannic would depart for Belfast for a full-scale transformation to an ocean liner. White Star was given $103,000 by the British government for the conversion, which was four months in before White Star was told Britannic was needed for government service again. Because of this, on September 24, 1916, Britannic departed, bound for Mudros, with her usual stop at Naples along the way. On November 3rd, she reached her destination, staying in port for two days as the transfer of the wounded took place. Finally, on October 5th, Britannic departed for Southampton. On October 17th, 1916, while Britannic was still in Southampton, the Royal Army Medical Corps requested permission to use Britannic as a transport of medical staff and supplies. The Admiralty approved the request, and when she departed Southampton for her fifth voyage, she was carrying an extra 483 medical staff as well as tons of medical supplies. On October 28th, Britannic arrived in Mudros, and throughout the next two days would receive 3,200 wounded soldiers from other hospital ships before she departed for Southampton on the 30th. She would reach her destination on November 6th, 1916, only staying in port for six days. Not only was Aquitania currently undergoing repairs, but medical authorities and Mudros desperately need another large hospital ship for the evacuation of the wounded. Because of this, on November 12, 1916, Britannic departed Southampton, carrying 1,065 passengers bound for Mudros. 673 crew, 315 RAM staff, and 77 nurses. Britannic passed Gibraltar on the 15th, around midnight, reaching Naples one day later in the morning of the 17th. Just like her other five voyages, she would be resupplied full of coal, water, among other things. Britannic was expected to leave port soon after, but a storm kept her in port until Sunday afternoon when the storm settled and Captain Bartlett was finally able to depart. The storm rose back up as Britannic left port, but by the 20th, the next day, the storm was practically gone. In the early morning hours of the 21st, Britannic rounded Cape Matapana, and by morning was entering the Kia Channel. It was a clear, sunny morning, with an almost glassy-like sea, when, at 8.12 a.m., a loud explosion shook the ship, which was described as if several pane glass windows smashed into each other from different directions. Immediately after the explosion, doctors and nurses left the dining room. Further aft, though, most people not feeling nearly as much of the impact assumed that the ship had hit a smaller boat. Captain Bartlett and Chief Officer Hume were on the bridge and saw the full extent of the damage. It was believed that the ship had been torpedoed, although it could have very well been a mine. No matter what it was, the damage was on the starboard bow, between holds 2 and 3. The force of the explosion was so great that the first four compartments were already filling rapidly. On top of that, the watertight bulkhead between hold 1 and the forepeak was heavily damaged. The tunnel connecting the fireman's quarters to boiler room 6 was also seriously damaged, with water flooding into the boiler room quickly. Captain Bartlett, soon after, ordered the crew to prepare the lifeboats, as well as sending out an SOS to any ship in the area. Little known to the captain, though, the antenna wire running down the ship's masts had snapped, meaning that even though HMS Scourge and HMS Heroic could heard the message, Britannic couldn't receive the reply. Captain Bartlett had already ordered the watertight doors closed, but the watertight door between boiler room 5 and 6 wouldn't close because of the damage received. This theoretically wasn't a problem, as the watertight door between boiler room 5 and 4 was undamaged, and since Britannic could stay afloat with up to 6 compartments flooded, she should have been okay. 
This was not the case, though, as nurses earlier in the morning had opened the ship's lower deck portholes in order to vent out the wards for the 3,000 wounded soldiers she would take on. As the ship listed harder and harder to starboard, though, water started flooding into the ship's aft of the bulkhead between boiler room 4 and 5. Britannic was flooding more than she could handle. Britannic would sink. Fifteen minutes after the explosion, water had flooded portholes on E-deck. With an increasing list, as well as water flooding the ship from two different places, Captain Bartlett ordered to steer the ship to the island of Kia, to their right, to beach her. The explosion had knocked out the steering gear, though, making it impossible to turn the ship with their own rudder. Because of this, Captain Bartlett ordered the ship's starboard propeller lowered in speed, diverting all power to her port side propeller. With almost everyone ready for evacuation, the captain ordered the lifeboat to be prepared, but not lowered. With the starboard lifts getting harder and harder though, the crew feared the lifeboats would be unable to be lowered. The engines were ordered off, but before they could, two lifeboats were launched on the port side, moving their way towards the still spinning port side propeller. The two lifeboats were sucked into the 23 foot wide propeller, instantly tearing them apart as well as the people inside them. Captain Bartlett was finally able to stop the engines before a third lifeboat met the same fate. One of the souls in those two lifeboats was Violet Jessup, a nurse who had not only been on Olympic when she collided with HMS Hawk, but was also a survivor of the Titanic sinking. She jumped out right before the lifeboat was sucked in. She did report feeling a bonk on the head, which she reported as the propeller, but that is highly unlikely. Nevertheless, she was able to escape, one of the few. By 8.50, most souls on board had safely escaped. At this point, Captain Bartlett had noticed a slower rate of sinking and ordered a halt to the evacuation as he once again attempted to beach the ship in Kia. Only 10 minutes after giving the order though, the forward motion of the ship had caused the rate of sinking to increase. Stopping the engines once again for the last time, he was informed that the flooding had reached D-deck. Realizing there was no hope, he gave the final order to abandon ship sounding the whistle two long times. As the water reached the bridge, he and Assistant Commander Dyke wafted off the deck into the water, swimming to a nearby lifeboat. With almost everyone safely off the ship, they watched as Britannic slowly listed to starboard and sank. Right before the ship made her final descent though, the almost 900 foot long ship slammed into the 400 foot depth, with the bow crumpling into the bottom and the stern rising into the air. Finally, though, at 9.07 a.m. on November 21st, 1916, Britannic slipped beneath the waves, 55 minutes after the explosion. For hours, passengers would wait until rescue could pick them up. While there were many ships in the area, many of them had to turn back after their decks became too full to fit anymore. Luckily, the water was relatively warm and the sea was almost glassy. In total, the rescue operation would span from around 10 a.m. when HMS Scored arrived to 2.14 p.m. when the last of the passengers were picked up. When they reached land, survivor numbers were able to be counted. Out of the 1,065 nurses, RAM staff, and crew aboard, 30 lost their lives, most of which from the two lifeboats which were sucked into the port side propeller. For 60 years, Britannic's wreck would lay untouched, untampered with, and unseen. Finally, though, in 1976, explorer Jacques Gusteau discovered the wreck, coming into the expedition believing she was sunk by a torpedo, since that was what many survivors he interviewed said. In the end, though, he found that the damage to the wreck suggested a mine collision. Ever since then, the wreck has been dived on many times, with Simon Mills purchasing the wreck in 1996. In a dive to the wreck in 2003, History Channel divers penetrated deeply into the wreck, finding open watertight doors and even more evidence that the ship hit a mine. A sonar scan of the wreck discovered mine anchors, and upon looking in U-73's log, it reported laying two mine barriers, each containing six mines, on the right side of the Kia channel. As of now, the wreck lying in 400 feet of water is in incredible condition, preserved by the favoring conditions and the tons of coral which have fed the wreck valuable nutrients. Britannic was many things a hostile ship, a potential ocean liner, but she had so much ahead of her life, and it was ended by war, a war which killed millions. Britannic was just another casualty of war, and if I were to describe her in one word, it would be wasted potential. Mm -hmm.